Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the part of the world that you're in. Um, welcome to the Venture Outfitter Weekly. Uh, this is a program of TechCrunch where we hear, um, we're organized around how do we help entrepreneurs that are driven by vision and values to, uh, to connect into the ecosystems that they need, to the relationships that they need, and, and find out what's happening out there. Um, the, uh, the main thing about today, we're going to have a couple different experts we, uh, that, are, that are going to speak about an expert and also a good friend of mine, Drew Shirley, who is a, uh, a who's been involved in the commerce a long time, and then started a national security innovation council here is going to be going through some information about what's happening in Austin around the defense architecture. So first off, I just me to the venture outfitter. The main thing that I want to go ahead and kick off with a couple of different announcements. Along with Chris Hughes, we're going to be launching a series of LinkedIn workshops. These are following up on the workshop that he did during the Venture Outfitter um, Weekly a few weeks ago. Uh, there's going to be three different topics. Chris, you want to give us just kind of a really quick, hey, this is what we're going to, what we're going to be doing with the uh, these seminars? Yeah, for sure. So these kick off on Friday, November 5th, which is next Friday. Friday. Um, basically... These are going in a progression from people who are just getting started on LinkedIn and are really looking to uh, establish a presence there and develop a content strategy and really start to establish their voice to get out and have more presence in their niche on LinkedIn. So that's what we're going to start with on Friday the 5th, which is generally LinkedIn readiness for solopreneurs and small business owners, talking about LinkedIn profile optimization, uh, how you identify where your ideal customers are hanging out you know, how you get in front of them to start uh, to get visible and then going from there to be prepared to start to create content. On Friday, November 12th, I'm uh, going to do an easy to implement LinkedIn content strategy, uh, just talking about what I call buckets and frames, basically content types and content categories, and how you can build a content calendar that's predictable, repeatable, and successful for you over the course of time. And Friday, November 19th is more advanced uh, LinkedIn tips and tactics to really level up your presence if you've been at it for a while. It's talking about some very tactical things you can do and some little copywriting tricks and other tricks you can do, um, not only to build strong relationships to help to amplify your community, uh, but also to just take your presence to the next level and uh, continue to, to get bigger uh, on the platform and, and have more visibility. So all these are completely free. Uh, they're going to be hosted live on the Crowdcast platform. Um, but to get on the wait list, just go to this link here, uh, go.zanateventures.com slash join free LinkedIn workshops waitlist. You'll add a waitlist there and or join to the waitlist there. And I'll be in touch uh, within a little less than a week uh, with information on Crowdcast and how you can join um, the workshops there. So 100% free, no expectations, no obligations. You'll actually walk away also with a one pager from each of these uh, with some with a good takeaway you can refer back to at any point uh, on the topics uh, from that day. Yeah, so uh, Tech Ranch, I'm, well, I'm happy that we're, we're co-sponsoring these. The thing, that, uh, the thing that actually is happening that's really interesting is, so Chris gave me a couple of different tactics. They said, hey, do this, do this, do this. And with one of the three uh, things he actually suggested, which took me about a, you know 15 minutes in, in total, I got, 1200 views on the item that I posted onto LinkedIn uh, that then led into a, a project. Um, so I was so impressed with that, that I wanted to make sure that, uh, that we supported what Chris is up to with his programs. I think that in some ways, some of the most valuable promotions that we've seen through social media has been this recently. And since most of our work is more in a business to business um, space versus business to consumer, it's a little bit more appropriate to use LinkedIn than Facebook or other platforms. So uh, it, those, all that information as well is going to be posted at the techranch.com slash events calendar. Uh, Jell will be uh, posting those. So make sure you take advantage of that. And you know, if you, if you can't find that long um, link, it'll be posted there as well. So cool. Look, I look forward to that. I'm going to be participating. I just, put it, well. I just put it in the chat as well for anybody that wants quick access and click on it. Perfect. 
Um, remind you really quick uh, that we have a number of different um, events that are all free. In fact, I've been telling a lot of people that the VO Weekly is, is a free program. We're just about to start really promoting this onto LinkedIn. I actually did an experimental event uh, on that. And so we'll continue to have the VO community, the VO Weekly, the online community available for you um, uh, for free. But then we're adding this, this part of the VO network. Actually, we've added it a while back and we have a number of you that have already gone through the, this programming. The, a lot of times the first step of packaging on the process to getting sales um, engagement or packaging on the process to getting investment, we're doing as part of the Venture Outfitter Network. Um, please take advantage of it. If you have questions about it, happy to tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the program. The, uh, the, the US-based price is $99 a month, or you can get a, um, you know, we'll give you 12 months for the price of 10. If you do that interaction, if you do that, part of what, um, what I've mentioned to everyone is that, that's done it, I'm going to keep this uh, going, is uh, I'll meet with you one-on-one -on -one about your venture to make sure you step through the, the venture essentials process, which is part of the VO network, um, to, to support you through that process. So that'll be happening very soon. Um, if you have more questions, just let us know, and I'll get get to the, uh, the part that I really want to get to. So... I've known Drew Shirley for a long time, both as a friend, as a professional colleague, and um, I really appreciate his background and his approach. He's very much in the line with the, uh, the idea of being the Austinite that is building community at the same time as you know, doing well while doing good. Um, we've seen this in his tenure that he was at the Austin um, Chamber of Commerce as well as uh, he launched the National Security Innovation Council is part of uh, the work that he does now. He also works with the Texas Association of Business, which is essentially kind of a lobbying organization that, uh, you know, for guys like me that are you know, long-term technology entrepreneurs that don't have a relationship with the government, this, this other organization that he's involved in is a great um, launching point. But what I want to do is since I know I'm on all these different levels, I really, I, I was like, hey, Drew, why don't you come tell us about what's happening with the U.S. Army, what's happening with AFWERKS, which is the innovation arm of the U.S. Air Force, and several other things that are happening around Austin. Um, what we'll do is uh, we're going to be somewhat informal. Drew will give us kind of some context, and then there will be a time for interaction and questions. If you do have questions as well. You can go ahead and chat them at any time, um, and then but we'll take verbal questions a little bit later in the uh, in the process as well. With that, let me hand it over to you and say, welcome. It's uh, it's great to have you here, and uh, I appreciate the work you're doing for 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 TechRanch as well as for Austin in general. Oh, it looks like yeah. you're on mute, by the way. Yeah. Well. Um... So thanks, thanks, Kevin. It was um, that was a really nice introduction. I appreciate you doing that, and uh, it's great to see some uh, good friends on the on the uh, net as well. Uh, Chris is is uh, absolutely fantastic, and I've really enjoyed getting to meet Omar uh, here. Um, so thanks for that, and thanks for the time. Um, can you kind of frame up so you're. Um, how much time you you hope I can share some overview and then we move to questions? I think that, um, you know, I was thinking maybe just 10 to, you know, 10 minutes of uh, just give us some kind of the lay of the land. It, yeah. And then I think with the group that we have, I mean, yeah. although we have a small yeah. studio audience, we tend to, the, the, the people yeah. here are, mm -hmm. will have a bunch of different questions, including myself. Yeah. Um, sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so uh, I would start with um, that I don't have a national security background. I don't have a military background. Um, I uh, so I come to this as a as a really as a skilled generalist, and um, you know I would I just kind of give you a, a few minute arc. I think of where the national security landscape is, and then a little bit more specifically about the ecosystem that is uh, developing and emerging. Um, there have been uh, there have been attempts uh, over the years to um, to change the way in which the the military does its work. Uh, as recently as yesterday afternoon, 
Uh, General Mike Murray, who is the four-star commander for the Army Futures Command, um, and who's nearing uh, his retirement and nearing his time uh, here in Austin, uh, described the Army as the world's largest bureaucracy. And um, when um, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Mike Milley, uh, was here in Austin a couple months ago, um, and he was, um, uh, it's not really a graduation, but having a, uh, a ceremony to recognize the first class of software factory completers, uh, a number of um, enlisted and young officer soldiers um, who are doing full stack development here in downtown Austin. Um, General Milley said, that uh, one of the problems the military has faced for most of its history has been fighting the last battle. Uh, it's been in that, in his estimation, that has cost millions of soldiers' lives uh, by a nation not looking ahead, not projecting ahead, and determining what they believe to be the threats and what they believe to be the um, capabilities five years out, 10 years out and trying to build, um, build a, a military and build a, a set of capabilities and soldiers um, for the future and not for the past. Um, but th this attempt at modernizing the military has happened several times over the last couple hundred years and certainly over the last 50 years. Um, and, and these attempts have really run against the wall of, of the bureaucracy and, um, and, and really it was the defense secretary under President Obama, uh, Ash Carter, who, um, who along with Eric Schmidt uh, of Google and several, of, uh, several others on something called the National Defense Board, put enough muscle and got enough people in play um, to create uh, at first, something they called the, def the, the DIUX, the Defense Innovation Unit, out of the U.S. Department of Defense. And they created a West Coast and an East Coast branch that were meant to attempt to change the culture of the Department of Defense. Um, I led the effort to bring uh, a third coast to that, a Texas operation that's here in downtown Austin. Um, and there were a number of follow-on units that came and remain here to this day. The Air Force uh, had created something called AFWORKS. Um, the, uh, the National Geospatial, the Spy from the Sky folks, uh, created a unit here in Austin uh, and in several other places. Um, but really it was um, a confluence of events that finally manifested itself during the uh, during 2018. So Amazon HQ2 had just been in, was in the news. There was a rapid and robust competition for Amazon HQ2. Uh, Senator John McCain was still alive, and you had a nexus of people at the top of the Pentagon who said, "We we have to change." They had started doing war game analysis. They were, um, they were shifting the focus away from Afghanistan and Iraq and saying, we, we have this great power struggle in front of us with primarily China and to a lesser extent Russia, and then super empowered um, groups that were really not affiliated officially with any government. And they, they said, we, we cannot move at the pace we're moving um, and they, inst they instigated a, uh, a change that was the first major restructuring of the army since Vietnam. And uh, I, I remember taking a delegation of Austin business people up to Fort Hood and, um, you know, I'm just going to show, show them about how, you know, they do certain kinds of tactical operations. And the biggest takeaway that those business leaders had is how and they weren't showing him the coolest stuff and they weren't showing him the, the top secret stuff. And this wasn't something that had security clearance. But the primary thing that business people came away with was how shitty our stuff was. That a lot of this stuff was really Vietnam era 
equipment. It was Vietnam era uh, bolted together and that the pace of innovation that was happening in China, the pace of innovation happening in the private sector was so far exceeding that of the US Army that it was endangering what the military called overmatch. And different people made different arguments. General Murray, who became the first commanding officer for the Army Futures Command said that the goal was not to break the Army culture. Um, there were others who said that is the explicit goal. We need to break this culture of bureaucracy. Um, there's a close friend of mine who said that there are too many people that are members of the League of Frightened Men uh, in the army that needed to, they needed to be moved out. And, um, you know, there's, there is a complacency that uh, the Army Futures Command was meant to address. So, um, so when AFC was cited here, um, I, you know, I, I learned a dramatic amount. And, um, you know, we had seven, 800 pages of different um, um, responses and uh, components of Homeland Security, airport logistics, um, innovation cycle, differentiated research capabilities, venture development organizations, all meant to kind of lay this out as a vision for Army Futures Command. Um, but we had not had in, in Austin an active duty presence since the mid 1980s. And Texas, which is the largest uh, by state um, military recipient, um, it, it uh, is, um, did not really have a coherent ecosystem as a state. And we still are, we're building one, but still lack one today. Um, and so uh, it is the home of the National Defense Manufacturing Base, primarily in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It's the home of the global energy base, but these were not working in a deliberate and coherent um, methodology um, to help solve differentiated problems. So, you know, let me, let me close out with a couple of, of uh, things. That, uh, that I have found of interest and you can tell me if you, if you do too. Um, one of them is the pace of change is so slow because of the incredibly cumbersome way in which um, contracting takes place. Um, it is in a very political environment. Um, as dysfunctional as Congress is, um, the national defense authorization and budget has passed every year for 60 years. During the entirety of Obama's eight years, they passed no budget. They never passed a budget. It was all under a continuing resolution, except for every year, Congress passed a defense budget. And so you do have a level of bipartisanship, but you also have an extreme amount of micromanaging of the defense budget to include contracting, to include um, uh, who's getting what amount of money. Um, there were all sorts of rumors about why Austin was chosen, part of which were political. So contracting and cracking open that nut of con contracting has been for me, one of the really um, key components. And as you look at the supply chain of creative contractors, uh, that's a real challenge. You do have things like the Air Force who've created this AFWORKS. The Air Force is still managing and, and would desire to keep Space Force as part of Air Force. Um, they have created something called Space Works. And Space Works has operations both in Los Angeles and Colorado Springs. And we're, we're working on trying to bring a Space Works um, uh, group to Texas. Um, Naval X, who, who is, uh, interestingly, for Austin, far and away, the largest research investor in Austin, by a long, long measure, um, has a relationship with uh, what's called the University Affiliated Research Center, uh, a UARC, uh, in the Breaker Pickle area. And um, there's a ton of classified research that's happening. But um, we hosted Navy Week 
which I didn't know what that was until a couple of weeks ago, and got them tours to, to, and I learned quite a bit about the naval research assets. Um, and then uh, in San Antonio, you have one of the largest venture efforts from the CIA that's called INQTEL, I-N-Q-U-T-E-L. Um, and you have others that are looking at venture arms um, from different agencies. So the Office of the Directorate of National Intelligence is one of those, um, the Defense Health Agency, uh, which is all of the Army health um, is supposed to be reporting up to the Army Futures Command for experimental biotech, biomedical. Um, and Omar and I have talked about uh, CPRIT, the Cancer Prevention Research uh, Institute of Texas, which is um, supposed to be funding big, big bet research in cancer uh, identification, prevention, treatment. Um, but you have this, you have these follow on efforts that have been happening. Um, and we're, we're attempting to create a map of what that ought to look like, what components are missing, and help to be able to go build those elements uh, here in the state of Texas. Um, and all of that requires talent, all of it requires capability. Um, so I would, I would close with, um, there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. Um, there's a tremendous amount of learning. Um, it's truly critical, as you've seen some of the tests that China has done in the last, that have just come to light in the last couple of weeks around um, uh, nuclear missile capable uh, test launches in uh, suborbit over the South Pole and the nuclear mesh, the defense mesh, um, and Taiwan and the semiconductor industry that, you know, the, I think there is a still a bipartisan consensus that we get this right, but it is, it is not a natural act. It is truly countercultural um, to most of these national security organizations to work together, to work at pace, to work at the speed of relevance. Um, in what is a really high stakes consideration. So this uh, just kind of a wave top view of the um, where the national security uh, kind of conversation is at the national level. And then uh, those components, you know, there's more that can be said from around the state uh, that can be said there. So, well, that's beautiful, Drew. The, 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 the thing, um, one of the things that's been happening for everyone else, the, uh, Drew hosts a, a number of different, or his organization hosts a number of different events, and I've, I've been participating as well. You know, in my case, I don't have a military background, but I definitely have an innovation background. And it's been, it's been very nice to actually interact with um, the Army and the Air Force and to see the receptivity. And I do think that there is a commitment to actually getting to startup speeds for innovation. Perhaps, Drew, you actually have, uh, uh, like what would be, is there a recent success story of a startup that, uh, or you know, some organization from the ecosystem that's gotten connected in that you could share with us, whether it's Army, Air Force, or, or Navy, yeah. or whatever it might be? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I would use as an example, Ascentium, and Ascentium could end up being a unicorn. Um, it is a, it is currently the fastest 3D additive manufacturing uh, in the world. And um, the, uh, the Texas military department, which is essentially the reserves, uh, is, is led by a guy uh, named uh, Major Alex Goldberg. And Alex, very impressive. Um, and, he, um, and, and he has since moved to a higher level position within the, uh, the, the Department of Defense. So uh, Major Goldberg um, took a delegation of, of, of uh, military leaders over to see the Ascension operations and and they led to non-dilutive investment in expanding their capability to manufacture um, and Ascension has been growing dramatically they moved their offices uh, from um, college station to Austin to tap into the labor market here um, you know I think icon printing 
uh, for their kind of development of uh, ad uh, additive manufacturing for barracks has been a secondary success. And both of those are from um, the um, DOD and um, they, what they call their defense innovation unit, where they can create rapidly within 30 days a contract that um, can flow significant amounts of money to grow. Yeah, just to give a little bit of background, Icon, um, Icon prints in, in cement here in startup here in Austin, it's doing really well. So just to, for the context, for those that don't know about Icon. So you were speaking about funding sources and non-dilutive funding sources. Could you give us kind of like, uh, what are the categories that you see in, in that? Yeah, and, and I do think, um, I do think, Kevin, if you want to revisit this topic, there are people who are who are far, far better. So I'd just say broadly. Um, but wait, let me let me respond to that yeah. before, and I'll, I'll cut you off for the responding to that. I we we want. I, I think there's a continuum on entering into um, the the whole process, and I I want to make sure I respond to that. Why you know, you might ask, you know, why do you? Why did I bring Drew? The the thing about it is like as as we start figuring out how to you know take a bunch of you know entrepreneurs and innovators and connect into the you know, the, the defense world, um, it does take first you know the community one of the community leaders that actually brought the this architecture to Austin, I think is really critical. And we will hear from experts about SBIRs and you know small business innovative research grants and things like that. But I want to make sure that we actually you know. For the, for the gentleman who actually was responsible for bringing here into our community, I want to really get a sense about that as well. Sure. I, I mean, I, I would just say that um, I think there are, there are people who, if you, had, uh, if you had specific questions, I would connect you to, broadly I, speaking. Perfect. Um, broadly speaking, um, you know, and I, I think a role for the NSIC is to be, is to be, um, is to be humble about what we know and don't know, um, and that we be second chair uh, in, you know, and not first chair, uh, and really try and just sort of help crowdsourcing the the plan of action and then help make sure it happens, and um, so. There are a couple different funding vehicles that are out there. The most common, uh, they're called SIBIR, but they are S-B-I-R, Small Business Innovation. Um, SIBIR grants that um, some units uh, can actually have, have revamped their procurement in such a way that they'll swipe a credit card and hand you, here's, here's the amount of money um, that we're investing in your organization, do, go do good things with it and it's you know that you have to apply for it um the defense innovation unit also has an afworks uh, air force has um ha has taken on some of those components of contracting um the uh sttr uh is another uh more involved approach cyber has a couple rounds of it the sttr uh is another um, version of that, um, and those are kind of uh, small business technology transfer programs um, that are um, uh, investable by the different innovation units. Um, you have organizations like NASA who will license technology or even transfer technology, and there are people that are um, specifically involved with um, with those types of um, grants within, say, a NASA, who will say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm out there in the market, we're trying to solve these kinds of problems. Um, we could transfer this technology if you can capitalize it. Um, I, I think the role, if I were to say that, I think one of the major roles that the federal government is trying to play in this is to, um, is to take the tech risk and so, you know, your advanced research projects are taking massive risks um, on very basic level, very experimental uh, level research. 
Um, and then these are trying to say, hey, why don't you see if you can make the technology work um, and we'll help you de-risk that. And then they're looking for the private sector to be able to scale it. Maybe they need some help with a SIVR, maybe they need some help with a tech transfer. Um, but once it hits at scale, um, I would use as an example, the AFWorks um, is very interested in seeding electronic vertical takeoff and lift. So, or in landing, excuse me, uh, EVTOL. And they have some very specific purposes for uh, the Air Force that they want these, you know, essentially flying cars to work, um, but they don't believe there's enough money for them to get the kind of rapid cycle change that they need. And, you know, that's, um, so they, they're pitching, they'll be pitching uh, mid-November um, some flying car applications in public safety. For an example, you know, you've got a, a, an accident on a crowded highway, you can't really bring a helicopter there. Uh, you can't really bring, uh, it's, it, you know, it'll take a little while for an ambulance to get there, but if you can bring in um, a manned or unmanned and drop it into a very narrow spot and be able to extract somebody uh, more rapidly, it can help on, on life saving. Um, if you've got big floods or if you've got big fires, uh, you're less likely to want to put uh, safety officers in the midst of those. And so they're trying to share the investment um, with different kinds of dual use uh, applications. So there's a couple of those that are happening with Texas Department of Transportation and uh, Austin Department of Transportation. Um, I, I'd just say a final thing on that. You know, I, almost every time I see General Murray, um, I will say to him, you know, as frustrated as you are, General, with the pace of change, as frustrated you, as you are with the bureaucracy and the pushback, at least you feel like there's a problem. And in most levels of government, they don't feel that sense of urgency or problem. And so my hope is one of the things that Texas learns is that sense of urgency um, that really only comes about when you know, our power, power grid almost collapses um, or we get fires or floods or hurricanes or, or the like, or a cyber breach. Well, so let, let's expand on that. So part of what we're going to be doing at TechRanch is helping entrepreneurs bridge into this connection. I want to switch over to questions, but I want to make sure I mention something that happened at the event that uh, Drew hosted yesterday. I was there in the head of AFWorks, the innovation arm um, associated with the Air Force. I just was getting to interact with them. Um, Part, part of the, the role that, you know, Tech Ranch plays is we're here to be, I call it being a talent agent, right? Discover talent, develop talent, connect talent to opportunity and help it scale. And so part of, the, um, part of what we'll be doing is specifically around this. And you'll hear some more. We'll have other speakers come in. Um, we're, uh, we've already been working on a grant in conjunction with, with um, Drew to specifically support that process as well as others as well. The other thing you might ask, though, is it looks at like at least half the audience is not from the United States, right? Uh, not from the United States. And the dollars that, that Drew was talking about are really targeted. Yeah, they're targeted at, you know, investments that are in the United States. Now, you can bring your company here um, and have a chance at, at, you know, if the company is housed here and has Americans employed, you can actually have a chance at going after that. We'll talk more about that. The other thing I want to mention, and I thought it was real exciting to hear from the head of um, from the head of AFWorks, it, when when we mentioned that uh, we had done some TechRanch has done a project for the um, Italian Space Agency in the past, and he was, he was kind of surprised and he said, "Hey, he used to be deployed in Italy as part of um, part of the Air Force and dot 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 blah blah blah." And he said, "Hey, Kevin, the thing that we would really like to have support for, and I want to make sure that this is why this is." Uh, applicable to international, our international entrepreneurs that are at, you know, some other country. 
a lot of times there's capabilities in, in other parts of the world that are unique, like as an example, the manufacturing capabilities of really advanced materials and material science in Italy that you can't find any place else in the world. And he was saying, hey, we can't take the dollars and put them there, but we can enable the bridge, like enable Tech Ranch to build that bridge. And so we'll be doing that type of activity. What I want to, the reason I bring this up is I want to make sure that, um, you know, for those of you all that when we do talk about these investment um, vehicles, they, you know, are focused on the United States, but then there's going to be opportunities as well that the Army and the Air Force recognize, and the Navy, I'm sure, recognizes uh, about getting other parties involved with unique capabilities in other parts of the world. So um, with that, we'll, um, we'll switch over to, to questions. Uh, Kim Johnson asked, asked a question, I'll just repeat it. Um, or Kim, why don't you, since you're on and you're live, why don't you just say it um, verbally? Right, thank you for bringing up the uh, Defense Health Agency. Um, we're actually a subawardee currently for the Army um, Medical Research and Material Command. Do you have any idea of the relationship between that and Defense Health Agency? Uh, because we're a subawardee, we can like to move up the food chain. Um, and, and what it brings into several discussions we've had with Omar, um, who, who would you say, or how important, how do I fit the priority of soldier readiness in its broadest uh, definition and who, who's really interested in, in readiness in terms of mental, emotional, um, you know, more than just physical activity, just, just the complete soldier or the complete person. Mm -hmm. Is it the health agency? Is it other things to the extent you know, or, or any other um, uh, uh, crumbs on the uh, roadmap? in right. the health area? So I think it's an excellent question. Um, I would, so, so I'll, I'll kind of level up for a minute. So what is the NSIC? NSIC is really in my mind kind of a network and the network is comprised of chambers of commerce, academic researchers, national security innovation leaders, um, economic development, elected officials, um, and, and really the, the, the key part of this is so that you can ask a question like that, and I can say, I think there's two, two things I would suggest and I'm happy to connect you with. So one, I had a call this morning uh, with Andy Rise, and Andy is at, um, he is in Houston, um, and, has been working on uh, human performance, human potential as part of the national security and military for a number of years. And he would give you a far better answer than I would. So that's that's first thing I'd say is I think you, you, you'd you want a Sherpa on that. Second I'd say is, um, so there are within the army 26,000 people that are part of the Army Futures Command spread out throughout the world. Um, and part of that report up is the medical innovation components. And so BAMC, Brook Army Medical Center, um, you know, the um, Reed uh, and several others that are working on, on medical innovation report up to the Army Futures Command. Um, they have they have um, had a, a gentleman named Colonel uh, Rick Ortiz at the Army Futures Command who has been working with the UT system uh, on a set of specific objectives that they want to do between Army Futures and uh, the UT system. And he, I think Colonel Ortiz could give you a fairly good, um, answer to that question. The, the final one, which is really the one you were asking, is the Defense Health Agency. So we've had, a, we've had a hard time getting our hands around it. And one thing that is different, that, that's just been a surprise to me, um, is, is how much transition of military leadership you have. You know, folks are in there for 24 months to 36 months in a given position. And, um, and it's just a, you know, you, you being able to, to have those relationships 
uh, on day one is is super hard to do. Um, so, uh, I, so those we've worked with maybe three or four different people at the Defense Health Agency. And just when I think we've got a good and trusting relationship with them, they've moved to some other, you know, they're, they're good and talented and somebody plucks them away to go do something else critical for the country. So it's not my best contact there, um, but it has led to, there's a desire to accelerate the, the risk-taking, the culture, decision-making, um, but it hasn't been, it, it is, nowhere near the kind of leadership that we've been looking to, to find. So I can connect you a couple better places than I can give you. And that's been my kind of high level sense. Well, welcome to healthcare. Yeah, indeed, they, they, that's, a, that's an interesting thing as well. By, by the way, I'll make sure I do a shout out. Um, we're probably going, we're, we're very, in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have something focused, even more more focused on healthcare. Uh, Kim, I'll make sure that we reach out to you about that because I'd like to get your input on, on the, uh, the presentation that's coming. Um, let, let, let's open it up to other questions. Uh, uh, as an example, um, one of the TechCrunch venture partners, Oma Zaki, has a defense-related background. Love to actually get um, uh, get uh, other feedback, other questions. Anyone want to hop in before? Uh, I everyone knows that I have lots of questions myself, and I can bring up. But we have time for one or two other questions, really quick. Questions. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll jump in and just kind of give a, another like perspective that, you know, uh, having attended a lot of the recent kind of uh, discussions around uh, Army Futures Command and kind of what the priorities are and where they're looking at trying to uh, tap into innovation, right? I think uh, one of the, you know, other ways of thinking about it is, um, you know, the readiness of the whole kind of organization of the military to handle the new innovations that are coming out. So, you know, sometimes people get kind of maybe uh, tunnel focused or narrow focused on like, you know, the new next best way to do something as, a, as an actual product or service versus like the actual preparation and kind of transition of major systems, major platforms, major, you know, procedures and, and installations that, you know, again, are going to be impacted by these other innovations and kind of how to handle that, right? And so one of the examples that I heard that I thought was interesting around, you know, electrification and, and all the new kind of opportunities around that is just, you know, well, how does that change the whole, you know, infrastructure and how do, and how do they kind of handle that, you know, change in terms of, uh, you know, implementations and uh, other services or other, so, I, you know, the entrepreneurship around you know, some of the needs of the Army's future and the military's future isn't just necessarily a new component or a new, you know, AI code or a new, uh, you know, device. It could also be, you know, a, a, a new way to transition, you know, the system and parts of the system, you know, with the new technology. So it could be services, right? It doesn't have to just be products. So I just want to kind of broaden that scope a little bit as well as, you know, when we talk to, you know, early stage uh, uh, entrepreneurs, providers that can actually still also be relevant to what's going on in the future of the military. So I'll make uh, one more. Go. go ahead. Sorry, I uh, uh, just had a quick follow-up kind of along those lines. I mean, is anyone looking at Industry 4.0 specifically manufacturing to get some of the stuff coming back with the Army uh, command? I didn't hear the full question. Could you say it again, Shelby? Or I don't know if someone else did catch it. Uh, you're on mute now, by the way. Is uh, Army's Futures Command uh, taking a hard look at Industry 4.0 to start bringing some of the manufacturing capability back to the U.S., or are we just still talking tech, uh, technology and uh, medical stuff? So um, there... So during the Trump administration, there was a look broadly at supply chains. And um, during the early days of the Biden administration, um, the Biden administration said, we wanna, we wanna do a much more 
deep dive into supply chain, um, both from a national security standpoint, as well as a, um, uh, a broader economic standpoint. And, you know, I would argue there's a lot of technology that is in use by, by the military. So, um, but it would also include things like rare earth and, and so forth. Um, you know, as there has been, um, the, uh, I would encourage you to read the 2,700 page bill uh, in Congress that is on the Senate side called the US Innovation and Competition Act. And in the House is a whole bunch of different um, bills. And right now the two chambers are integrating, um, they're integrating that into one package, but it was passed overwhelmingly in both chambers, just in different forms and legislative vehicles. Um, but it is, uh, it is looking to seed and invest dramatically higher amounts of money into some key technologies, quantum computing, um, you know, uh, advanced manufacturing, additive printing, um, uh, advanced energy. So those items alone were an additional $100 billion a year. There, was, there were efforts to build an additional 10 US innovation centers. Um, for the semiconductor industry, uh, we've been working with a group um, called by the governor uh, on helping to secure what we've been calling Semitech 3. And then there's also an advanced packaging material um, there, you know, 5G, so forth and so on. Has it gotten to industry 4.0 yet? I think, I think those are just beginning. I, I think the, the public dialogue has been China is gaining ground or has overtaken us in some key areas. We need to do something. What do we need to do? We're willing to write big checks. Yeah, I don't know that it's gotten beyond that all the way to industry 4.0. Interesting. Let's see, we're going to take one last question and then we'll start bringing things to a close. Uh, Ed White, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, are you aware of any or any preferred uh, platforms that exist that um, that any of these entities use to facilitate things like crowdsourcing or uh, leveraging the gig economy to address some of these um, deficiencies in a way that is um, uh, it's easy to interact with, you know, if you're, if you're a small entity, are there any platforms that a small entity could, uh, could expose themselves on in a way that uh, would maybe get them uh, opportunities? Um, I feel like I'd be guessing at what you're asking. Can you tell me a little bit more? Well, I guess what, you know, I, I was, I was kind of spinning off of what, um, what, um, Kevin had said earlier about TechRanch being a talent agency, right? And I know that there are, you know, uh, commercial um, sites out there like um, crowdsourcing sites out there and gig economy sites out there like uh, Upworks and, and so forth that uh, individuals and small entities and small groups can uh, expose or advertise their capabilities in a way that they could be brought into discussions in a proactive way by uh, by these organizations. I mean, it's, I'm looking for a way to um, to broaden the network in, in, so that it's a, it's both sides are searching for each other as opposed to single side searching, and uh, asking if there if you're aware of anything out there like that. I think there are there are people who have put their finger on what you're talking about. Um, I don't think there is anybody who's gained kind of a market dominance, if you will, on it. Um, so, um, I think you have folks that are trying to, um, there's a, a, a local group and they're not the only one, uh, here in Austin called sustainment tech that is attempting to, to, you know, build a platform. Um, you know, there are some like fed tech that are trying to connect deep kind of deep learning, more early stage research with um, relevant people within the federal government. Um, but I think um, I'm happy to, you know, to field an email question and try and connect you with somebody who can better, better answer that question. 
Thanks. But when what we'll do is um, specifically on that, like I, uh, like I was mentioning, part of where I see that Tech Ranch can play a role is that um, just recently, one of the one of the four Tech Ranch entities um, applied to uh, the DOE's Department of Energy's American Made process. And we will be following up as well. Um, the American Made is essentially they're doing open innovation with small grants. Um, we, one of our four entities is like this one. We applied for a grant. One of the other ones is going to become a connector in that organization. And so I, I see that that's part of our role to actually really help suss that out. Uh, the other thing that happened, just to mention, since it's uh, this is the right time for us to talk about it, is we did go after as a group, um, as an SBIR, or with uh, one of our Mexican startups in the lead in the technology, um, bringing it to the United States to then wrap around uh, uh, on a specific thing that the Army Futures Command was going after, a program called Fire Faster. We did not get the grant on that, but it was interesting about how to bring you know, three or four startups together around this uh, issue. And I suspect that we'll do that uh, again, um, multiple times, because we built Skunk Works in the past where instead of, um, instead of it, well, Skunk Works like a disruptive innovation for a larger corporation, where we'll bring you know, three different companies or three different startups around solving uh, that problem. Um, I'm, I really love, you know, given my innovation background, I love doing that sort of stuff. And I think it's one of the ways that we can help move the needle faster. Um, what we'll do is we'll start bringing this to a close. Um, Drew, I want to say thank you for your time today. And especially kind of being off the cuff in a very Austin style, informal, giving us information and helping build that, that bridge as we're looking to build a bridge from, you know, the, the tech entrepreneur community here to, uh, to the uh, to the military and see how we can actually help them get up to speed and, and make sure that they, t they, they do their job. <laughs> um, any closing words that you'd like to say, Drew? Just just thanks. And, you know, I think I think, um, you know, this is a it's a critically important issue for um, for the free world. So solving it is critical. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, with uh, the report on October 4th of just a few uh, days ago, 52 uh, warplanes from China were going over Taiwan, and that's a problem because that affects, that affects us in the computer world on this side of the world. So, well, I appreciate your time today, Drew. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have you back. And um, if there's anyone that, uh, if some of the connections go back and forth, I would love to have, I would personally love to uh, be connected. I know that in the chat session, there were a lot of different statements about, hey, you know, um, connecting, uh, connecting around. It'd be valuable as uh, for us to have some visibility at, at TechRanch on the connections that are made because we wanna make sure we help you lead those as well as go even farther as we discover this as a community brand. A lot of this, we can learn faster together as we're um, stepping into this, this process. Uh, one thing I want to mention, and I think he was on for a little bit earlier, um, but a shout out to um, Richard Hurley. We've heard uh, he's a long-term technology entrepreneur at the, at the Tech Ranch, was involved in Venture Forth, like in the Venture Forth 20 series or something like that. Just launched a book about music and math. Okay, why, why am I bringing it up? Um, look for this on Amazon. I just bought a copy of it. We've heard on uh, the VO Weekly before some of the stories about how uh, Richard has used a totally different process for getting, uh, for supporting children that are not neurotypical. That is, they might be on the autistic spectrum or something else. Uh, one of my favorite stories about, uh, about what he's done and the impact he's done is having one of the students that can barely play piano go, go from barely playing the piano to having a, um, a concert at, and I'm just gonna forget the name of the famous hall um, that uh, uh, that's dyslexia for you, but make a long story short, a real exciting that he launched that and uh, I'm really proud of that venture. So I wanted to make a shout out if you're at all uh, moved to, uh, to, to grab a copy of that book. 
Um, join our email list if you haven't already. And then not only on the connect URL do we have the email list, but you can send this email to the overall team if you need to. You can sign up as a mentor. You can sign up as a country manager. We're going to have a lot of the different um, points to connect into the tech ranch there. If you're in the community and you haven't formally put yourself on the email list, make sure you do that. If you don't do that, then you, you're not going to see a lot of the newsletters that are coming out about what's happening around the tech branch. And then uh, one final word from one of our, um, our uh, sponsors, uh, Duo Works is uh, Linda Blackman, who is Venture Force 17. Uh, it runs Duo Works. It's a co-working place here in Austin at 183 Mopac and 360 at the intersection, kind of in the core intersection of Austin. Just want to make sure that if you have a chance Join us here. Uh, there are special offers that they have for um, even lower than $200 a month. If you're an international entrepreneur and you need access to a point of presence, uh, you can use Duo Works uh, all the way up to they have a really nice training room and, and facility here as well. Um, so in just closing, as a, as a group of entrepreneurs that are driven by visions and values for you know, making the world a better place, uh, let's you know continue to work together as a community to drive this forward. Um, you know, it's it's through us as entrepreneurs that we can really drive things in a different way than you know the world's ever seen before. We just heard from Drew as an example. You know, large organizations, including the Army, don't know how to innovate. We that's our role, and by doing this together, by you know coordinating together, as I've said, the school of piranhas up against the sharks and the whales of the world, we can actually move faster. So with that, let's go change the world for the better together. Thank you all. And we'll call it a close for another VO Weekly. Thank you.